have here a copy of the sci science magazine, Discover. And uh, the question is asked, was your ancestor a sea sponge? <laughs> then it has a picture inside here of a sea sponge, and it says, uh, no ifs or buts, this is your ancestor. This is your ancestor. Well, you know, these are scientists. Talk about presumption. Talk about faith. It goes on to say in the article, listen to this, it's quite funny. Questions posed decades ago by Carl Woese, his mentor at the University of Illinois, and other scientists such as how the essential unit of life, the cell, came into being, are still unanswered. So they say, we don't have a clue. We don't know how it started. But having said all of that, they say, your ancestor was a sea sponge. It sort of illustrates a great truth. Lots of people will believe anything but the truth. Lots of people will believe the craziest ideas except the truth. This book is the truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. And Jesus said, your word is truth. And this book tells me where I came from, why I am here, and where I am going. Please take your Bible now and hold it up, and I want you to say these words after me, please, because these words are going to set the theme. We've done this lots and lots of times. This is sort of a tradition we've got now. Here it is. This is my Bible. This is, this is God's Word. God has a message for me today. This message, his message, will give me everlasting life. Make me a better person. I now open my heart to receive God's word. Amen. Would you please open your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 8, and we shall continue our studies in the book of Daniel. In the last few weeks, we were going through uh, Daniel 5 and 6 and 7 and so forth. Now today is Daniel 8, which describes the cosmic struggle between right and wrong. The cosmic struggle between good and uh, evil. Look at me for a moment. Did you know this? If there is no God, then there is no good. I meet all sorts of people, scientists, all sorts of people, and they talk about right and wrong. They've got no valid reason to talk about right or wrong. Traveling over to Australia, I sat beside a lady who was married to a well-known scientist in this part of the world, and she was talking about some of the great problems in her life, and I started to talk about God. She said, I don't believe in God. But then in the next breath, she said, but this is something happened. She said, it's so wrong. I said, how can you say something is so wrong if there is no God? What is the basis for right or wrong? Well, she said, well, we all believe it. I said, you simply have a nonsensical, mythical, romantic notion upon which your beliefs are based. I said it not quite like that, but that's what I meant. <laughs> Because it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. Then as we got along a little bit further, she said, it almost appears as though you were meant to sit beside me. She said, do you normally talk to people sitting next to you in a plane? I said, no, it's a part of my religious faith. When I get in a plane, I just put the seat back and I go to sleep. <laughs> well, she said, why don't you talk to me? I said, well, maybe, maybe somebody wanted me to. 
Maybe somebody wanted me to. Well, she said, it does appear as though it was meant to be. This chapter today gives amazing evidence of God. Bible prophecy shows that there is a God. One great theologian said, if genuine prophecy is found in the Bible, then the main issues of the age are met. Think that through. If there's genuine prophecy which is, that is found in the Bible, then it shows that there is a creator God. Amen. And that we didn't come from a sea sponge, but that we came from the hand of God. Please notice Daniel chapter 8. Now I'm going to give you an exegesis, a brief exegesis of this. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. The one that had already appeared to him was the vision of Daniel 7, the four beasts, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the monster, as you know. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam. Now that was the capital, the summer capital of ancient Persia. I'm sorry, the winter capital of ancient Persia. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but came up later. I watched the ram as he charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. Listen carefully. In the book of Daniel, you have four major lines of prophecy. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 9 through to 12. Four great lines of prophecy. And these four lines of prophecy are based on the principle, now get this, of repetition and enlargement. And Daniel chapter 8 basically goes through the same ground, across the same ground as Daniel 7, except that in Daniel 8, Babylon is about to go down. So Babylon is left out. And so here you have this ram, and he is conquering the whole wide world. I wonder, what does this represent? Would you please notice verse 20 of Daniel 8? where the angel gives the interpretation to the prophet. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. And so the ram represents the same power as the bear of Daniel chapter 7. Just keep this in mind because this is an historical foundation that we will find useful as we move along. Verse 5 of Daniel 8. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came towards the two-horned ram I'd seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. What would this power be? This, of course, is Greece. Babylon is gone. Then Medo-Persia. Then you have Greece. And on the goat, you have a prominent horn. What would this represent? Alexander the Great. This is like the leopard beast of Daniel chapter 7. Remember the leopard beast. And this power... The goat was the symbol of the ancient Macedonians. And when the Macedonian kings went into battle, instead of just having shields, which they also had, they carried a face mask of a goat. Alexander died in his early 30s, about the same age of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when he died, the Bible says, when he was great, the, the great horn was broken. And in its place came up four towards the four winds. As he was dying, his generals went past his bed and they said, Alexander, Lord, to whom shall the kingdom go? He said, it shall go to the strongest. And as you all know, after a number of years, the kingdom of Alexander was broken up among his warring generals. This took a number of years, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And so we are here on good ground. Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. But now we come to Antichrist. Would you please notice this? This is of great importance. Daniel 8, verses 9 and onwards. Out of one of them came another horn, or another king or kingdom, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. That, of course, is Palestine. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of, some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. I wonder who that is. It took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. This is the great antichrist of Bible prophecy. Here is a king or a kingdom that comes out of one of the divisions of Greece. And this king doesn't simply make war against earthly kings. He makes war against the king of kings. Most commentators, particularly Jewish commentators, have taught that this king is Antiochus Epiphanes. Now you may say to me, who was Antiochus Epiphanes? Well, he was a pagan king who came from Syria and he made war against the Jews and in his attack upon the city of Jerusalem, he killed 40,000 Jews. And then he went into the temple and desecrated the temple and offered upon the altar a swine. And so almost all commentators have said that this king is Antiochus Epiphanes. You can read the story of Antiochus Epiphanes in the Old Testament Apocrypha in the book of Maccabees. Everybody ought to read the book of Maccabees simply for history's sake. And it tells the story of the brave Jewish Maccabees in their war against Antiochus. But I notice A.J. Mason in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians writes, even those prophecies of Antiochus in many points do not suit Antiochus at all. And not only so, but the Jewish expositors themselves held that Antiochus had not exhausted the meaning of the prophecy. They themselves applied it to some antichrist whose coming should proceed and be defeated by the Christ. And so there is no question at all in my mind or in the minds of many, many commentators that Antiochus doesn't fit all the themes. At the very most, he was a shadow of the great Antichrist who would come. But if what I told you before is true, if the prophecies are based on repetition and enlargement, this power is not Antiochus. This is the power of Rome. So after Greece came the great power of the Caesars that overthrew Palestine. 
and that nailed Christ to the cross and that took away the daily sacrifice and that cast the sanctuary to the ground. But more than this, after a number of years, the Caesars retired or were overthrown and a new Caesar took the place of the pagan Caesars. And if you go, my friends, to the ancient city of Rome, as many of you have, you will see there on the great obelisks the words, Caesar Augustus Pontifex Maximus. The title of Caesar, Pontifex Maximus. And if you go, my friend, into St. Peter's Cathedral, you will see the names of the popes. Pontifex Maximus. And in Bible prophecy, there is only one Rome. Not two Romes. There is only one Rome. Let me read to you some statements. This is from the rise of the medieval church by Alexander Clarence Flick. The removal of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople in 330 left the Western church practically free from imperial power to develop its own form of organization. The Bishop of Rome in the seat of the Caesars was now the greatest man in the West and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. To the Western world, Rome was still the political capital. The organization of the church was thus put on the same divine basis as the revelation of Christianity. This idea, once accepted, led inevitably to the medieval papacy. The papacy through the bishop of Rome became the ruler of the world. It is the church of Rome that is the little horn. Now, I want you to read these words again. These words today are seldom preached in churches. In fact, it's very, very difficult to get a television station even to carry what I'm going to say today. We say we believe in freedom of speech, but it's only freedom of speech if it is politically correct. And this is true with most television stations that are owned by Christians. But there'll be some who will carry it. My friends, the three ABN will, I'm quite sure. Now notice verse 10, and we shall notice the work of Antichrist. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. Look at me. Can you think of any words in Revelation that are a copy of those words? Can you think? I believe I'm talking to a group of people who know their Bibles. Revelation chapter 12. Shall we turn to that for a moment, please? Revelation chapter 12. And Revelation 12, I would remind my dear friends in the Catholic Church and in the Protestant churches, Revelation 12 is not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. Revelation 12, verse 4. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. So here is the horn that rakes across the heavens. And verse 7 says... Verse, verse 9, the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. What does it say? 
who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now listen very carefully. The real Antichrist of Daniel chapter 8 is Satan. And Satan works through earthly powers. He worked through Babylon. He worked through Medo-Persia and Greece and pagan Rome and then pagan Rome passed on the power to the church. And the medieval church joined forces with the state and enforced religious laws and changed the word of God into a lie. Now notice this, read on. Verse 11, it set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. The prince of the host is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at me, the prince of the host is the Lord Jesus. It took away the daily sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was brought low because of rebellion. The host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did and truth was thrown to the ground. Bear with me as I explain the war of Antichrist upon the God of heaven. Listen carefully. It says that the little horn would make war against, number one, the prince of the host. The host, God's people, the prince of the host, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, the prince of God. The daily sacrifice. Now before I go any further, I want to get something off my soul. You're going to hear this more fully next week. But there is a dreadful deception today in Australian churches and in most American churches. You know what it is? That religion is hopping up and down and feeling warm and fuzzy and talking in tongues and shouting and rolling. I'm going to show you next week, that's a part of Antichrist. The only safety for the people of God is in an understanding of the Word of God. When I go on vacations, I go along to churches and the Bible is never opened. And you go and you join a Sabbath school class and they talk about what happened to you this week. How did you get along this week? How are things going for you? And they say, wasn't that a great study? What what of? Somebody's latest husband or wife? So I go along to churches, I turn on television, and I hear lots of emotionalism, lots of talking, lots of religious hype from religious salesmen, but I don't hear the word of God. And that is why people are being deceived. Now this power makes war against the prince of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, the prince of the host. The Bible says he, makes, he takes away the daily sacrifice. Now God had a sanctuary. And in that sanctuary they had a sacrifice. They would kill a lamb or another beast. Do you know what that represented? That represented Calvary. That represented the death of the Lord Jesus. Anything that takes away the daily sacrifice is antichrist. The Bible says this great church would take away Calvary. And then the Bible says the sanctuary was cast to the ground. In the sanctuary, you had God's priest. You had God's sacrifice. And you had God's law in the very ark of God. 
covered by the Shekinah glory. In the ark of God, you had the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Did you know this? God made a world, and in the center of the world, he put Palestine, the promised land. In the center of the promised land, he put Jerusalem. In the center of Jerusalem, he put the sanctuary. In the center of the sanctuary, he put the most holy place. In the center of the most holy place, he put the ark of God. In the center of the ark of God, he put the Ten Commandments. And in the center of the Ten Commandments, he put the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day. If you go to the Hebrew words, the Sabbath is right in the very center. And the Bible says the Antichrist would cast down to the ground the sanctuary, God's priest, God's sacrifice, God's cross, God's law, God's Sabbath. Now, I want everybody to know this. I come from a Roman Catholic background. All of my relatives on my dad's side are Roman Catholics, and I love Roman Catholics. I could have been a Roman Catholic priest. You say, perish the thought. Goodness, what do you mean by that? You think I would have been tougher? (laughs) I went back two weeks ago to where I came from. I went to the little town of Esk. I was proud of my roots. A little town of about a thousand people, squeaky clean. I went to the little old hospital where I was born, still the same hospital. I went at the back of the hospital, a few hundred yards to the cemetery, and I saw where my ancestors are sleeping. I went down the road from the hospital and I came to the Roman Catholic Church. I thought it was the biggest church in the world, just a tiny little Roman Catholic Church. But that church had such an influence upon my life. I went a few miles and I came to Somerset Dam. My father helped to build it before I came along during the days of the Depression. You know what a flying fox is? Not the thing that flies, the little creature. The flying fox is used to take, it's a cable that goes across the river so they can drop the concrete. It's still standing there today up on the side of the mountain. My father worked it. So I went back to the place where I came from. My heart was moved. I went back to the house where I grew up, well, as a little boy. I'm just three or four years of age. And I remembered it. And it's still there. And it's still painted the same color. And there are still people running around, standing up on stumps. I remember playing under the house as a little boy, playing in the dirt. Most of the folks there are Roman Catholics, some of the finest people in the world. So what I'm saying today is not meant to be derogatory of them personally. The Bible says this power would make war against the Lord Jesus. I want to read you some statements. These are from the Roman Catholic Church. For thou art the physician, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman. Finally, thou art another God on earth. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or even interpret divine laws. The Pope can modify divine laws since his power is not of man but of God. And he acts in the place of God upon the earth. These are Roman Catholic statements. Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Dictates of Gregory VII now, that the Roman church was founded by the Lord alone, 
that the Roman pontiff alone is justly called universal, that he alone can depose bishops or restore them, that all princes should kiss the feet of the Pope alone, that it is lawful for him to depose emperors, that his sentence ought not to be reviewed by anyone, and he alone can review the decisions of all, that he ought to be judged by no one, that the Roman church never erred nor will it according to Scripture ever err, and so forth. These are the claims of the Roman Catholic Church. And she's never changed those. Then Pope Leo XIII said, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. She's never changed those things. In this church and in its power are two swords. This is from the Vatican. To wit a spiritual and a temporal. And we are taught by the word of God, as we, and this we are taught by the word of God. Behold, here are two swords in the church. The Lord did not reply that it was too many, but enough. And so it goes on to say, the church has got the two swords, the spiritual and the temporal, and the temporal is for persecution. This is the power that put itself in the place of God, it is the power that took away from Jesus Christ his priesthood, or at least they tried to. Let me read you something now about the daily sacrifice. The daily sacrifice represents Calvary. A Roman Catholic priest believes this, that in the Mass, when he takes the bread and says the words, this is my body, the bread becomes the actual body of Christ and the wine becomes the blood. Oh, you say, they don't believe that, my friend. What I'm telling you, go and ask any Roman Catholic priest. Ask the Pope if he'll see you. This is from the Council of Trent. Listen to this. The Council of Trent. If anyone saith that in the Mass a true and proper sacrifice is not offered to God, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. If anyone saith that the sacrifice of the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and of thanksgiving and not a propitiatory sacrifice, let him be anathema. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that it has the power to bring God down from heaven and sacrifice him upon their altars. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Doesn't it concern you that this great nation has an ambassador to the Holy See that goes against the Constitution? Does that concern you? Or do you close your eyes to it? So far as the practical effects produced upon the soul are concerned, the Holy Mass has in some sense the advantage over Calvary. We therefore confess that the sacrifice of the Mass is and ought to be considered one and the same sacrifice as that of the cross. For the victim is one and the same, namely Christ our Lord. Not only this, listen to this blasphemy. The priest is also one and the same, Christ the Lord. For the ministers who offer sacrifice consecrate the holy mysteries not in their own person but in that of Christ as the words of consecration itself show. For the priest does not say this is the body of Christ but this is my body. And thus acting in the person of Christ the Lord he changes the substance of bread and wine into the true substance of his body and blood. It is truly a propitiatory sacrifice. That means an atoning sacrifice. You didn't know that? Well, good Roman Catholics know it. That's the heart of their faith. That is why they consider that Protestants are heretics because we say this is blasphemy. And this great power is taking the world uh, captive. And maybe some of you folks 
who are watching the television program, and maybe some of you folks who won't play this program because you think it's going to cause people to get mad with you. Maybe if you don't, God will get mad with you. And notice, so here you have the great portrayal in the Word of God of the Dark Ages and the Antichrist. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, They're angels. One could be our Lord, we believe. How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled, the vision concerning the daily, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary and of the host that will be trampled underfoot? He said to me, it'll take 2,000 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated or cleansed or vindicated. Look at me. I fear for the souls of God's people because their knowledge of Scripture is so superficial and they are so easily moved. And they think in sound bites. So you know what the, you know what the political people are doing? They listen to somebody talking and they want a 10 second sound bite. You know why? They say, that's as long as the people can concentrate for. So people decide great issues on a 10 minute sound bite, 10 second sound bite, and a lot of shouting and oomph and hurrah. That's, de that's deceiving people. That thinking is leading people to get the mark of the beast. And you and I ought to become students of the Word of God. We ought to read the Word. You say to me, I don't have time to read it. Well, you won't have time to go to heaven either. You ought to realize that. So the question is asked, how long? That's the cry of the saints. How long? Now let me give you some theology. In Russia they have a word choot-choot. That means little, little. I'm a choot-choot theologian. So let me give you a little theology. The Hebrew word here for cleanse or reconsecrated is is nitzdak. What is it? Nitzdak. And it comes, as you know, from Zadak. Zadak. Zadak means to vindicate or justify. It is a word that is used in courts. It has, as the theologians say, forensic connotations. It means it's a word for judgment. So it says, after 2,300 days, then... Uh, the sanctuary that represents the kingdom of God is going to be justified or vindicated. Now, this book is a book of symbolism. These days cannot be literal days, as those who believe in the theory of Antiochus Epiphanes teach. They must be symbolic days because they go from the days of Persia to the very borders of eternity. The Bible says there will come a day when God will sit in judgment, when the Antichrist is going to be unmasked and the true gospel is going to be proclaimed to the world. And that will be the vindication of the sanctuary. Now, Please read on verse 18, 15 and onwards. Verse 15 and onwards, dear hearts. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. Now the only person who'd given order to Gabriel is the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Jesus. You say, I don't want anything about prophecy. I just want to talk about, I want you to talk about Jesus. Well, here Jesus is telling you. Amen. He says, you better get, better, better get straight on this. Verse 17. 
As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Now look, the time, are you listening? Are you concentrating? Or are you a congregation of 10 second sound bites? The time of the end in the book of Daniel refers to the period of time that borders eternity. I won't give you too much more on this point, but believe me, in Daniel chapter 12, don't turn it up now, it talks about the time of the end in the context of the judgment and the resurrection. At that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name is found written in the book. Oh, there's a judgment. Yes, it's written in the book. And then many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That is not an Old Testament thing. That's talking about something future. The 2,300 days reach to the borders of eternity. Now, what is the verse saying? Now, this will help you to understand why we do what we do. At the close of the 2,300 days, what will happen? One, God will unmask the Antichrist. That's why I preach these prophecies. Those ministers who don't preach these prophecies, I'm afraid, are walking in darkness. Number two, God will restore the everlasting gospel in its fullness. He will uplift his holy law and magnify his holy law and uphold the Sabbath. It tells us where we came from, where we're going. And he will vindicate his people. Let me tell you why I am what I am. People say, and they look at me in amazement, even people from the conference. They say, but why? Why do you bother? Why do you go to Russia? They said, some of them said, why does he go to Russia? What's he doing? These are ministers. I wonder what he's up to. I say, preaching, pre preaching? Because people are lost. Oh, people are lost. I face it all the time. You folks know in Revelation 14, you don't need to turn it up. You ought to know it off by heart. You have the three angels' messages. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. In Daniel 7, the gospel is taken away. In Revelation 14, it is restored. Then it goes on and it says, Worship him who made heaven and earth. In Daniel 8, the high priest is attacked, but he's back in Revelation 14 as the creator of heaven and earth. He's the one who wears the triple crown. And then it goes on to say, If anyone worships the beast and his image and gets the mark in his forehead, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That is the unmasking of the papacy. That's why I preach it. I try to preach it in love and I try to preach it in grace, but I'm not going to be a traitor to the cause of Christ. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Why are we televising here today? We have visitors who come in and they sort of look like a deer that's been caught in a, in a bright light. They come in and they say, what are they doing that for? Why? They got no idea. They're walking in darkness. Members of our own denomination, walking in darkness, tied up with all sorts of silly little programs, but not preaching the gospel. It's happening in Australia, in our churches. You know where they got it? They caught it from us, not this church. No more preaching. Oh, you preach? Oh, we don't preach anymore. We just counsel. You go to the churches, dead as dead can be. Nothing worse than a dead man preaching to dead people. 
but in Revelation chapter 4, and it's everywhere. And if you don't understand the Word of God and the prophecies, you're dead. Revelation 14 then goes on to say, here is the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God. And Daniel 8, the commandments of God are cast to the ground. In Revelation 14, they're restored. And God's church exists for one supreme purpose, not to do real estate deals, not to do smart psychology counseling, even though those things may be necessary. I'm talking about pastors. We should have psychologists and psychiatrists, but the pastors ought to be preaching the Word. And that's why we exist. That's why we're planning, if you folks get behind it 100%, to bring Justin Norman across. Otherwise, he's not going to come because he's doing quite well where he is. But you've got to be sold on it. Listen, unless one clearly understands these themes, one will be deluded and deceived by Satan and by his manifestations in the last days. Read on fast, verse 18 and, 18 and onwards. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent the four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty man and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay ill for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. It was two and a half thousand years ago, but not today. The scroll has been unopened. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And we're living in the time of knowledge. How does this concern me? American living here in this land of prosperity. I was going to say peace, but I wouldn't say that. But a land of prosperity. How does it concern me? Number one, there is a prince of darkness. And there is a prince of light. And there's a great war that's going on between the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness. And there are no neutrals. If you're not 100% for Jesus, as far as God considers, you're 100% lost and 100% with the devil. Satan's greatest weapon is religious deception. All the way through the Bible, religious deception. Some of the people who talk the most about religion are the ones who are the most deluded. The time of the end is now. Now is the time to reject false religions, to read, believe, and obey the Word of God, Amen. to believe the true gospel. Grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone, Christ alone. And we have a high priest, he's in heaven, that we confess our sins to God, not to any earthly man. That we do not believe in religious hierarchies. Christ is the head of the church. Now is the time to believe the true gospel and keep God's commandments and be ready for the judgment. 
And remember, God's people are on the winning side. One final text. Daniel 7, which is the basis of Daniel 8. 26 and 27. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. That's the same as the cleansing or the vindication of the sanctuary. Parallel passage. Then the sovereignty, power, a greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. Look at me. When I look around this world and see what is happening, when I look into the Middle East and see what is happening, when I see the possibilities of war with North Korea, And now talk of Syria and Iran, which is going, she's going to arm herself to the teeth. The problems in Israel, continue war there. When I see the crime and the violence, and when I see how people are so easily manipulated by slick salesmen, I know that we're living at the end. My prayer is, even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us kneel. Our Father, we thank you for this astounding prophecy. Forgive us, Lord, for our indolence, our closed-mindedness, our worldliness, the fact that we've watched television and so much rubbish on the screen for so long that we're known around the world as the people of the 10-second sound bite because that's the most we can take in. Help us to realize that Satan pretty much won the battle. It was all over when he taught us just to trust in our feelings or some religious emotionalism or some ecstatic high and not to be a student of the word. Teach us, dear Lord, to return to the faith of our fathers and to the daily reading of the Bible. Now, Lord, you know, we've got problems because many people come to church just like when they go to the movies to come to see what's going on. But our Father, might it be today that the Word of God will enter into every heart. And those who are not ready for the judgment when they leave this church today and go out and get a drink and start to socialize, may the thought keep pounding in their minds the hour of God's judgment has come. May they wake up tonight. May they be unable to sleep. May the voice of God say the hour of his judgment is come. Help us, dear Father, to seek your face and to find you while you are still available. As we're praying in church today, how many will raise a hand and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Lord, lower your hands. Then Lord, I am going to change my habits. I'm going to read the Bible every day. Can you raise your hand? Make that a vow. Make it a vow. Only do it if you really mean it. But you better do it if you're planning on going to heaven. I'm telling you. 
Raise your hand and say, I make a vow to God that I will read his word every day. I will read it. I will believe it. I will obey it. Dear Father, bless these upraised hands that represent upraised hearts. These are good people, Lord. 